Fade, and also why I think in the long run, Fade can be a great villain for this adaptation of Dune. There will be spoilers from the book in this breakdown, so if you haven't read Frank Herbert's novel yet, or you don't want to know some of the scene details from the back part of the story, then I'd recommend watching this at a later time. This marks the continuation of my Road to Dune series, where I will be doing topical videos and essays on the film, leading to its release this March. Before I get into it though, if you want to keep up to date on any of my content surrounding Dune Part 2 and beyond, then don't forget to support this upload by giving it a like rating, subscribing to the channel, and turning on your notifications. But without further ado, let's dive into the character of Fade Rotha in Dune Part 2. So fans have waited a long time to see Fade in Denis Villeneuve's Dune, and from what we've seen so far, I think he could become one of the most iconic characters in the director's potential trilogy. Yes, we all know that he was a standout in Frank Herbert's book, and that he even stood out in David Lynch's adaptation of Dune, even if that wasn't the greatest of films. But there's something about all the footage we've seen for part two that makes me think Austin Butler's take can be one to to really do justice to the character. Now, one of the things that stood out to us in the first trailers for the film was that yes, his appearance is different from that of the book, and Denis has clearly tried to fit him in line with the other Harkonnen characters. In part two, he's sporting a bold look and a more physical presence like his brother, yet from new behind the scenes looks, it seems like Denis has also kept an essence of the charisma and intelligence that the character portrays. Frank Herbert's description of of the character read as a round-faced teenager with dark hair, and what we got in our first look of part two was definitely a departure visually from what we saw in David Lynch's Dune with Sting's portrayal of the character. Dune part two has transformed Austin Butler with a bold head and a completely white complexion, and it's possible that the Harkonnen homeworld, Gady Prime, is a key facet for this particular look. Now, I did a whole video on the black and white footage months ago, and I think this look is actually a result of the pollution on Gady Prime, greying out the landscape and resulting in what we see from those scenes with Fade. Cinematographer Greg Fraser was asked about this choice of footage in a recent interview on the Designing Hollywood podcast, and while he didn't give us a reason for it, he did say that it wasn't an aesthetic choice and that it did have a reason. So that leads me to believe even more that this is a result of what Gady Prime looks like during the daytime with all the pollution. And when speaking of those black and white scenes, a lot of them seem to be showing us early moments with Austin Butler's fade. From what we've seen, we've had shots of Fade Rolfer in stylish black and white entering a gladiator-esque fighting pit where he's in full Harkonnen armour, fighting with and brutally killing contestants he faces. This is where we first meet the character in the book, wielding his famous dual knives and showing off his fierce abilities and charisma for the many in attendance to see. Among those watching on in the arena is Leia Sadu's Margot Femring, who appears later in one of the trailers during an intimate moment with Fade. Their romantic relationship stems from the plans of the Bene Gesserit, and Margot is known to seduce and have a child with him. This all comes from the thought that Paul Atreides might be dead, and the Kwisatch Haderach ideal may have to pass on to another child. Essentially, because Lady Jessica defied the Bene Gesserit sisterhood by producing a son, it was a spark for the high tension between both Fade and Paul as the heirs of their houses. With the potential for one or both of them being killed in battle, it would destroy years and years of genetic engineering, so in turn the sisterhood, so in turn the sisterhood sent Lady Femring to seduce Fade and have a child with him. The hope was that they would save that developed genetic material. So Denis is clearly not skipping the Harkonnen scenes and plot developments that were missed in part one, and it seems like he's showing a lot of those moments on Gady Prime 
time with Fade to act as a darker twist on all the stuff happening with Paul. Him gaining support from the Harkonnens in the arena and the demonstration of his physical abilities in battle make him appear as a good leader. So I think Denny will show this back and forth portrayal of a potential heir, giving us the comparisons and differences between them. It will of course culminate in Paul and Fade's Chris knife battle, so hopefully in the build up to that, the film will really develop these introduced characters and showcase their importance as known from the source material. During the fighting pit scenes in the book, we get a sense of the brutality yet intellect of Fade's character, and we also learn about how the Baron favours him to be a worthy heir over a barn. The trailers have definitely communicated that brutal and cunning side to Fade, and I think it's the first of many assets that can make him an intimidating villain in part two. In fact, many have compared him to Darth Maul in Star Wars in terms of his appearance in this film, and to be honest, I can see that comparison from both a visual perspective and from his quick and brutal fighting style. I personally think Dune Part 2 can go beyond just a standard portrayal of a threatening villain though, because the very purpose of Fade in this story, and as a dark reflection to Paul, can communicate the central themes of the Dune story more clearly, and the Harkonnens part within that. The scenes of the Harkonnens in the trailers, whether it's the sequences with Fade or Raban bowing to the Baron, show that Denny is tapping more into that side and really showing them as a brutal reflection of the Atreides. So by showing the twisted nature of that and also detailing the Harkonnen plan from their perspective, the world of Denis Villeneuve's Dune will start to become a more revealing tale through all of the developing plot points and angles to it. Using Fade as both the central focus of the Baron and a central viewpoint of the audience when it comes to the Harkonnens makes the threat of part two all that more interesting. That viewpoint alongside the Fremens culminates in a particular battle for the ages. Paul and Fade's knife fight is one of skill between two future leaders of the galaxy and heirs of powerful houses. In the fight, they are only allowed to use knives, with Fade Rolfer using the Emperor's blade and one of his standard blades with a poisoned tip, while Paul uses his Chris knife. In the book, the fight starts with Paul studying his opponent, while Fade continuously talks and taunts him. Fade attempts to stab Paul with his poisoned blade, once getting an upper hand, but Paul doesn't back down and manages to eventually turn the fight in his favour. And after an intense battle, he kills Fade by stabbing him through the jaw using his Chris knife. Now, Fade isn't the most dangerous villain in the whole Dune universe, but he is the perfect foil to Paul, and the events of this fight can really showcase that on screen. We've recently seen some new footage from it in behind the scenes featurettes and you do get a good sense of the creepy side to Fade and how Denny is aiming to keep that and his mentions taunting during their battle. This is not like the Jamis fight from part 1 where a proud Fremen warrior fought to the death. It's a battle between two heirs who have been showered with advantages over many years to get to this moment. Only someone who has spent their entire life built up like Fade could hope to stop the potential Kwisatched Haderach, and the Harkonnen villain is definitely that in a twisted sense. Paul demonstrated his superiority against adult warriors, and his regal upbringing and Bene Gesserit training have moulded him into the messianic figure that he is. But when put up against a fighter with a lot of the same advantages, it results in a much more intense and fascinating face-off this time around. It's a fight of skill, physicality, and internal struggle, being a moment that defines the future of the universe. And while Fade dies in this fight, the cinematic power of this moment and the culmination of both Paul and Fade's journeys here has the potential to live on just like it did in the book. I think by focusing on that, Fade as one side of the coin can become an iconic staple of the Dune universe on the big screen. 
But while from a narrative and thematic sense, Fade has the potential to be a great villain in this new adaptation, what I think will really carry it over the line is the performance of Austin Butler. The Oscar-nominated actor has made a breakthrough in recent years, most notably for his performances in both Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Elvis, which got him a nomination for Best Actor. While he didn't win that award, the actor is clearly on the rise, bringing to life both eccentric and unique performances with every film. For me, he's an actor that can really communicate the distinctive features of his characters in just a few scenes, and getting someone like that to play Fade is, in my opinion, a great casting decision. He completely transformed in Elvis, being able to inhabit his every move, mannerism, and inner feeling during every big performance or moment in his life. There's a reason that Lisa Marie Presley praised that this particular iteration for being the closest to that of her late father. And to do that without coming across as just a realistic portrayal is something that the best actors find a way of doing in the face of many challenges. Austin Butler's take on the iconic music star was half an impersonation and half original. His physical and vocal traits were electrifying and you can see why he spent years watching every bit of footage to learn exactly how to perform like him. But it's how he put an emotional spin on those moments, elevating his performance and the film as a whole. So after that possibly being my favourite performance in a film in 2022, I'm only more excited to see him transform once again and put his spin on an iconic Dune character like Fade Rawfer. Everything we've seen from him looks devilish and striking on screen, and I think Denis and his team are definitely saving a lot of his scenes for the film. Film. We'll have to see, but as a whole, when it comes to performances, Austin Butler's Fade is probably the one that I'm most excited about with Dune Part 2. For much more videos and news on Denis Villeneuve's Dune Universe, then subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. Also, if you enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like rating and follow me on social media via the links in the description. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I've been Cortex, and as always, make some noise.